So we're going to talk about Cassandra from a client and a transport architecture perspective. Um, my name is Nate. I work at Apogee. Um, the platform development lead for app services team there. I've been working with Cassandra for about three years now, almost coming up on four. Um, I'm the lead developer for Hector, the primary Java client. Um, so I've been doing this for a couple of years. Uh, I, I know a little bit about clients and transports here. Um, Apogee, real quick, does API analytics, um, back end as a service. We have an ASF licensed open source project called UserGrid that's um, pretty cool. Blah, blah, blah. I don't like vendor pitches either. Um, so clients and transports in Apache Cassandra. Um, but real quick, uh, who, who's using Cassandra right now in production? OK, not that many people. Um, who's using CQL? OK. Um, how many of you have been using Cassandra for more than a year, guys that raise your hands? OK, cool. So a few people. All right, um, I'm gonna take a quick step back and look at some high-level architectural stuff we're gonna need to stand, understand for the scope of this discussion. Cassandra is what's called a sparsely columnar data store. Um, that's just a fancy way of saying that how, when you have a RDBMS, in the way RDBMS stores tables, is that you end up storing information like your table structure external to the data, and you have to map the data, usually in a B tree, and so you end up with stuff like null on disk, and you have to reserve space for those null fields. Um, Cassandra does things a little bit differently where if the data's not there, it's not stored. Um, this is what's meant by the sparsely part, and the columnar structure itself is something that is, can be dynamic, so in one set of rows we have, you know, pretty well defined set of modeling cats. In the next set of rows, maybe we have um, all within the same you know, table structure that we can have entirely different columns and values. Um, so that, that's pretty powerful. And again, if the data is not there, it's not stored. Um, or you know, on the end of that field, I could just as easily put a blob if I wanted to, if I was in that type of thing. Um, the data modeling in Cassandra, therefore, is really just how you take advantage of the, the column or data structure. They're just sort of four common patterns, or uh, if we follow. Um, I'm gonna detail three of them here just for time's sake. Um, the simple object to row, sparse objects to rows, materialized views, and what's called a manual index. Um, a, a lot of presentations out there have only those first three. I usually like to add that last one because um, there seems to be kind of common patterns emerging about how that works. Um, so let's look at the first three. Um, simple object to row. It's pretty easy, easy to grok. Um, that's just a static column family like we had in the previous example. Um, sparse objects are a little more interesting. Um, like our previous example, say instead of just modeling cats, you want to model pets, right? So I have a water temperature there that's only really relevant for fish. Um, and I have a type. Um, every row needs to have a type. Maybe I'm deducing in my application. Maybe that's how I do. Um, like in Hibernate or something like that, how you do uh, discriminators. Um, you can do something similar to your application level. But nobody else needs to have a water temperature if it's not a fish. So I can store that, and I can store that efficiently. Um, and this is what we refer to as dynamic column families. Uh, materialized views are a little different. Um, is, those you generally find in, in time series data, like a web log storage is a common usage pattern. So I have a key that sort of loosely models like a date structure. Um, you know, yesterday at 10.03 and five seconds, um, I was stored those log lines. And then at 10.03 and 10 seconds, I store some different log lines. So that, that makes querying really efficient because those things just lay on a disk in order. Um, and a, a previous Yuki and Michael did a good job of touching on sort of how the reads work there. So I'm not going to go into that. And there's a lot of information out there if you really want to know how reads come off the disk. Um, but just know that, that this, that in, in any of these data models, that this is how the data sits on disk. Um, so regardless of the approach we use, there are four overall goals when you try to design something for Cassandra. Um, you denormalize, right? Um, joins are expensive. Joins, that, joins don't scale. Um, 
anybody that tells you different is selling something. Um, you try to eliminate seeks, and you design for reads and optimize for blind writes. Um, then that's really the way to, to fully take advantage of a column or data store like this. So with that background, let's take a look at protocols. Um, the current one, the traditional protocol, is uh, Apache Thrift. Um, been around for a while. It's been with uh, Cassandra since the beginning because um, it came out of Facebook. Cassandra itself came out of Facebook. Um, it's referred to interchangeably as the API and the protocol because that's essentially how Thrift works. Um, so Thrift is RPC based, which is uh, interesting by itself. Um, it's an Apache project that's been around for a little while. Um, again, it came out of Facebook. It's in use in a lot of internal infrastructure in a, a bunch of companies. Um, supports a lot of languages. There's a lot of, uh, it's easy to make an object definition and then compile it and have it spit out for your language. Um, it's extensible. You can extend the thrift methods in Cassandra if you know how to do it. Um, Datastax Enterprise actually works this way. Uh, there's a couple other projects out there that, that do something similar. We do something similar internally for some of our things. Um, so then there's CQL, which is, as a protocol goes, is, is shiny brand new. It's a um, well-defined binary protocol. You know, there's excellent documentation out there that's on the wiki that details how the protocol works. Um, it supports compression, which is interesting all by itself. You, you can turn that on and enable that in Thrift, uh, but it's not straightforward in the way that Thrift has sort of been shoved around and hacked and Cassandra makes it sort of an uh, arduous task and it's not, it would have to be some hacking to do that. Um, it's based on Netty and NIO, um, which is a, a really sort of a good idea because that's become the winning horse in a lot of the you know, Java APIs out there. Um, not an Apache, pro Apache project, but it's a solid, solid API. Um, it's been around for years and a lot of people in that project know what they're doing. Um, so with the two protocols there, let's look at actual storage mechanics of how both of those interface with the data model that we looked at. Um, Git slice. This, um, I'm just gonna detail this one. Uh, it's, again, there's any number of presentations out there about how this works um, on the internet as covered a little bit before. But uh, most of the Xander read methods are, are, all the Xander read methods are, are permutations of this, largely. They all hit the same method eventually in storage proxy. Um, so this is a thrift definition in sort of all its glory and all its ugliness. Um, you know, it, it, it does what it does. And as we go through this here, it's pretty easy to see that, okay, I need a key to do, you know, let's get sliced, pull some columns off a disk. Um, I need column parent. I need to know what, what column family or table I'm querying. Um, the slice predicate is like a, you know, a, a query predicate. This is what defines the row range I'm looking for and what columns I'm looking for. And then sort of more interesting, and these were covered in presentations, previous presentations as well. It's easy to spend minutes on this, but I'm not going to. Is consistency level. Um, each operation is, can define its own consistency level. Um, so this seems obtuse at first glance. Um, it kind of is, but we just take a step back and, and then look at why SQL was created to address some of these perceived problems of usability. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll sum it up like this. It's, it's one person's abstraction leakage is another data, is another preferred method of reading data. Um, so when looking at these two APIs, it's really a matter of how closely you want to understand and interact with the storage engine. Um, Michael's presentation earlier did an excellent job of summing, summing up sort of the new changes and how the schema works. Um, so take a look at that, as, and I'll go into a little bit of detail there, not, not as much of what's going on, but just some, from the perspective of what you need to know as an application developer working on this stuff. Um, so. Back to where we are, with the, we'll look at the client APIs. Um, so working with Thrift, um, the benefits you have are a mature selection of clients. Um, there's not one, not two, but three really mature Java clients out there um, that have been, uh, two of them have been in the water for years and years, um, for three years at this point. Um, you have Hector, which is one, uh, my project, and um, I'm not going to remember the name of Dominic's project, and I feel bad because he's a good guy. Uh, now, Astionics is a Netflix one. What's Dominic's project? 
Yeah, uh, there's, there's a third one out there. <laughs> I, have it, uh, I can't remember for the life of me. Um, and, and then you have uh, Astionics, which is uh, the, sort of the, the new client and probably like the next, next best hope for thrift. I'm pretty much in, in, or in patch maintenance mode on Hector. I don't have time to devote to it. And Netflix has like three people on Astionics, and it's, it's a solid client if you want to do thrift. Um, so multiple languages. Um, there's drivers out there for, for a lot of stuff. There's a lot of people have been hacking on this over, over the years. Um, it's well documented. There's a lot of tutorials. There's a lot of uh, documentation on the thrift methods themselves, strangely. It's one of the few places there are. Um, and, and you can use thrift in other places in your architecture. Uh, and and, a, and a, lot of, a lot of places do. I, I think Evernote has extensive thrift deployment internally, as does uh, the Square, given that they, you know, Brian Duxbury works there. Um, the drawbacks of thrift are that, as we saw on that git slice, you have to compose several objects for any request you do. Um, some of the APIs have gone to great lengths to hide this, um, but in doing so, they get quite different in their implementations. So what you're doing in Ruby looks wildly different from what you're doing in Java is not at all what you're doing in Python. Um, and if you have any sort of polyglot development going on in your shop, that's kind of a big deal and something you need to think about. Um, and there's upstream dependency issues. It's, it's not a project directly under control of Apache. And if you actually open the transports and the Cassandra source code, there's, there's comments in there, like fix for thrift 631, you know, SSL issue hack, like side hack for this, because you, know, you couldn't get a bug taken upstream. And like, that, that kind of stuff happens. When you have like a core dependency and it's you know, upstream project that's not moving at the same velocity, you are moving a different way. Um, so that's something to think about. Um, not the case with CQL because it's a language defined as a binary protocol, so that's really not an issue of dealing with you know, project dependencies. Um, schema changes in cluster health needs to be done proactively. And we'll show you a bit more on this when you um, go into the benefits of CQL, but there's, you have to actually proactively query from these APIs. It's like, how's the cluster doing? Are all the nodes up? Are there any schema changes? What's going on? Uh, as opposed to having that state pushed back over a channel. Um, and so that, that gets us into the benefits of the CQL API. Um, store procedures is one. That's, that's really compelling. If you do a lot of small, tight reads, this is an awesome feature. It is faster. It, goes, it works very well. Um, and a lot of people have put a lot of time onto this. Um, the common operations are really straightforward to do. If you're just doing like really granular selects against static column families, it works really well. Um, cluster health and schema changes are pushed back over the NIO channel. This, uh, Michael went into this in presentation. I, I can't emphasize how big a deal this is. Uh, when you have a large cluster in the water and a large number of webheads hitting that, like app, web applications or whatever, getting that health sent back and forth over the wire and be able to, to you know, make, make adjustments in your application code after receiving messages is huge. Um, it, the fact that they built that in is just, that makes it, I put that down as a benefit here, is that there's an awesome client available. Um, and, and talking with Michael and looking at what Michael and Sylvain have done, you know, on, on building this client out is, um, it's really like everything I would have done if I had a chance to start from a clean slate. And I, I can't emphasize that enough. It's, it's really, it's a solid piece of software um, for anything like along these lines. Uh, it's certainly worth looking at depending on your workload and what you're trying to do. So that gets us into the drawbacks of CQL API. You still have idiomatic clients. Um, it's still a binary protocol, so you still need a client to run and parse it um, and generate queries and send us over the wire and et cetera. Um, you still have a default, and the default storage model exposes some Substantial restrictions, and I have a gotcha sent, imposes some substantial restrictions. I have a gotcha section on this later, but um, we'll get into that in more detail. But first, let's, let's look at just high level considerations for your application. Um, stick with Thrift if you have heavy update workloads. Um, there's some shenanigans going on in CQL created tables that generate some um, 
sort of extraneous marker rows that can fill up space pretty quickly under some conditions. Um, dynamic large batch insertions. If you do lots of large insertions of like time series data for like web logs, like one of the examples we've shown, um, see where you know one insertion can have a hundred mutations, another insertion can have you know several thousand mutations back to back. It's not trivial to write the CQL for that. Um, you basically have to generate large string concatenated expressions and pump those over the wire. You can't use a stored procedure because a stored procedure um, has, an, I have an issue linked to here in a different section, um, but the stored procedure can't take a dynamic number of batch insertions. So it's an open issue for that. It'll get worked on eventually, but it's, it's not there yet. Um, Hadoop integration. The, all the Hadoop tools, Pig, Hive, Hadoop, um, can't read the CQL table definitions. Um, 4421 is the issue for that if you want to track that. That's also open, no progress on that. Um, if you commonly deal with really wide rows for the same sort of reasons, uh, there's, there's no real benefit to using CQL because the rows aren't named, um, store procedures don't work. So it, one of the things here to also note is that you know, where we write wide rows with CQL is that you have to do things like, as you saw in Michael's presentation, is when you set up the table and pick you know, the key that you're going to shard on, um, you have to pick that shard key carefully. And you know, I, I've, I, I've seen this language before, and I, I, saw, I saw this on a mail list you know, when, when we first started talking about this. Now, I thought to myself, where have I heard that before? You know, it sounds like, you know, that, that's pick our shard keys. You know, we're, oh, that's where I've seen that before. You know, um, I, that's, that's something that I, I don't, I don't like. Uh, that that that's an issue. Um, that that's a real big issue for me. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later. But um, so consider CQL if you have a lot of static column families. Um, we take advantage of store procedures for common reads. They're faster. They're a lot faster. Um, we compress the wire format. Um, despite the shark key jab, the CQL make, does make good use of the storage engine, the way the rows are laid out. Um, again, see Michael's presentation for just the way that's structured. Um, you can replace some custom serialization with the collection stuff that's available now. Um, that's pretty slick. There's a lot that could be useful to some people. Um, it's really easy to integrate with JDBC and BI tools given that it's a query language. And that's sort of what's been the goal on, on the DataStacks roadmap is to make that easy to use for enterprise developers. Um, if you're a large enterprise shop, this might make sense for you because it's, it's going to be a big win. CQL is also really wire efficient. Um, it doesn't return a timestamp or TTL by default. You have to add for those explicitly, which those can burn. Um, uh, you know, 64 bytes each on a wire. If you're doing a high read workload, that's you know that adds up. Um, so, larger, potentially more transient environments. Um, if you have large clusters with uh, nodes going in and out, the uh, ring state pushback and the um, schema change stuff that that's that's a good idea. Uh, that that provide a lot of benefits for you. Um, the data stacks driver again takes the gossip listeners and listens for ring state changes and gets notifications of when their schema updates and can pass those around and, and you know, make decisions at the application level based on that. Um, and, and you can do this with Thrift as well, but again, you have to be proactive. You have to make that query explicitly. Um, and a lot of the Thrift client libraries out there, at least Hector and Astyonix, will both go out and run like a background thread every 10 seconds or configurable number of seconds to say, you know, to query ring state and make sure that all the hosts are still up and to, you know, look and see if there's been any schema changes, et cetera. Um, but at the end of the day, this CQL is newish um, and it's an abstraction. It's an abstraction model over some hidden machinations in the storage engine that you know, because it's new and because it's abstractions, there's going to, there's going to, there are, there have been, and there will be bugs. Oh, it's the nature of the beast. And in general, in some cases, it might not do what you think it should. 
Um, because it's an abstraction, there's going to be impedance mismatches. So there's some pitfalls to be aware of. Um, the most common ones and some of the most sort of severe ones that stuck out to me in, in researching this past month or two were um, collections can only be retrieved in their entirety. Like that's sort of, okay, so you have maps and you have sets and you have lists, but if I want, you know, member, you know, 20 of a 50 item list to have to go down there, if I want member, you know, 200 of a 5,000 item list, you know, you get the idea. Um, that it is documented that it's probably not a good idea for larger rows, but it's, it, it can give you the wrong idea. Um, there's certainly not a replacement for materialized views in the column. Um, but there are, to be fair, there are a good replacement if you're doing a lot of uh, your own custom serialization within rows. It, it's a good way to, to think of that. Um, and that gets us in another big issue is you can't mix static and dynamic data in the column family. So when the original data modeling use cases we saw there, the, the, the sparse objects, you, you can't do that with CQL because every column needs a name. You know, you'd have to name every column for your entire um, data model to do uh, discriminator type stuff. And that, that could be a pain in the butt if that's what you're doing. Um, keys only range slices don't work. This is, um, I use this all over the place in some of my code for, for what we do. Uh, there's a really efficient way to check for existence of rows in Cassandra and not have to touch the columns on the disk where you just touch the key index. Um, I, I'd recommend you look at that issue if that's a use case you use or something you think would work in your app because it's kind of a big deal if you make use of it a lot. Um, also, arguably a feature is that range goes aren't returned anymore. Um, and Thrift, when you delete a column, you still will get that column in a, when you delete a row, you still will get that row in a response back with no columns. Um, if you've been using Cassandra for a long time, you know this and you've accounted for this in your code and you probably have a lot of legacy code to deal with this. Um, again, arguably this is a feature because it's sort of a pain in, pain in the butt. But at the same time, it's different from what you'd anticipated as an experienced Cassandra user. It's, it's, it's just not what you would think. And you might have some code out there that's designed to deal specifically with this. Uh, so that's just something to be aware of. Um, batch inserts are clunky. I talked about that. And that you can't say, um, I'm going to do, in a stored procedure, you can't say, I'm going to do eight batch inserts in one and 10 in the other. You'd have to define those two separately, um, which sort of negates the benefit of the way batch mutate works in a way. Um, high performance right, rights works and gets us back to you know, some, some of the four original reasons why we design Cassandra databases the way we do is you have to optimize for blind rights. Um, you can't do it with CQL. It's difficult. You have to compose those statements with uh, concatenation of strings the same way you would or like some sort of builder object under the hood, which is you know, might as well be doing mutations at that point. Um, and I put this one in blue because it's a big deal. With non-compact storage, a whole row must be read every time. Now, this is the, the, the pseudo row that is in there um, in the row chunking, um, not the shard row, but it's, it's super important to know that if you have like a biggish object, like 20 fields and you only want to return field one, um, you know, name, that you're still gonna get those 20 fields back, uh, regardless, they need to be read, regardless of uh, which one you want to do. Um, and so that this may not be something that you want to do, depending on how you use your data. Um, the takeaway from this is that you have some options, particularly good ones for Java. You have the, a really solid data stacks client that's sort of built on what has been learned over the past couple of years, use cases and what everyone's doing. Um, a, a solid and, and currently high velocity development client for Netflix that has a lot of tricks in it, can do like binary object serialization, um, write ahead logging, so you can do client side you know, failure logging, a um, uh, bunch of neat little tricks like that. Um, Pector's been around for a while, again, we're just in patch maintenance mode at this point, but it's solid, there's very few bugs there now, and it's well understood, and there's a number of examples of how to use it, it's got a big community, so. Um, what you could do is, you know, turn on both the transports, see which one works best for you. Um, they're both options and you know, this is a standard configuration file for 1.2. So you can turn these both on and, and play around with them at the same time. Um, run them on different ports and see what, see what you like. 
So, take another step, because I, I have another section here. Um, it's sort of uh, gonna ruffle some feathers. Um, the past year, working at Apogee, so I, I've been, went from, you know, in the trenches of dealing with APIs and Cassandra to move way out to the edge where I'm, I'm doing nothing but working with developers on, you know, REST endpoints. Um, learned a lot about what developers particularly want. Um, when you've seen what we've seen at Apogee in terms of how people want to use Cassandra, we've had a couple big customers come to us with what we're doing with user grid and say, gee, that's sort of exactly how I want to use Cassandra. And just in conversations I've had with friends, you know, in the past couple of months, particularly over CQL and the directions it's taken, is, um, you know, most developers want to interact with services, and they want the services to not be in the way, and they want them to be uh, familiar. So I think there's, like, a larger problem here that is sort of fundamental to the shape of the community and where we're going in the future. Um, what I've seen from real users, you know, some of these people, some of these people are custom customers of, you know, large NoSQL vendors and caused me to like really rethink how I want to approach this stuff. Um, and this next slide I'm going to show is, you know, I, I was hesitant to put it up here, but I, I really think it needs to be out there. That's a real quote. Um, that's an issue. I think it's a big problem. This is another thing. I think the market's spoken, and you know, we made a new wheel, and we made it square. Um, it seems like every other NoSQL vendor out there has, you know, rest at points, and that's how people want to work with, you know data sources at this point. Everyone understands this. This is, this is easy. People get that. You could do this from a JavaScript client. Um, this actually fits with one of, the fundamental, one of the fundamental characteristics of Cassandra I impose. Also, how many HTTP clients do you think there are out there? You know, not only do you not have the uh, protocol language problem, you don't have the client problem anymore. Um, Cassandra MVP actually maintains a REST front end. There's two large data stacks. Customers that actually run REST service infrastructures hacked on top of Cassandra in production. Um, people are doing this anyway. And I, I think this is something we've just missed the boat on. Um, and, and, and looking at this with internally at Apogee, this is one thing we hit on and one thing we realized will work better for our workload. So we, gone and done something about this, is we've actually created an internal project in development right now that is just pure experimentation, um, like what would happen if we did, you know, a couple of things, like what if we, we left the operations to be defined in JSON payloads completely, where you could group any set of operations together in the same payload that you wanted to and send them to an endpoint as a post and say that, you know, I want to insert five columns. I want to take the results of that insert and apply them to um, a Git operation down in the next, below that. And then I want to take the results of that Git operation and take some, J some JavaScript I just uploaded in this pay well as, payload as well and do some dynamic transformation on that before I return the results back to the client. Um, so we started messing around with this, and there, there's a project out there that we're going to talk about a lot in the next month or so, um, working with a couple of different people who are really popular in the community on this. Um, we're calling it Introvert. It's based on Vertex and Cassandra. It's ACF license, and it's been driven by real-world requirements. People in the trenches have been writing Cassandra apps for a long time. Um, so you'll be hearing a lot more about this in the next couple of weeks. Um, March 20th, particularly, at the Data Stack Summit, Cassandra NYC is going to be the sort of the coming out party for this. Um, so it'd be kind of neat. Um, that said, after I rained on a couple of parades, anybody have any questions about client transport stuff? Nope. 
It's a really easy one. It's the uh, CQL client that you recommended. Basically, if you would have built it yourself, you would have did it the same way. Yes. So, uh, just, I just need the, uh, the name. That's uh, the Datastax driver that um, Michael showed earlier. Uh, it's on Datastax's GitHub site. You actually. Ooh, that's not what I like to do. So I get for looking and not typing. Um, it, it, it's great. I love it. It's called Java Driver. I'm so glad that they didn't continue in, in the, the name of weird mythology. That was just annoying, and we need to stop doing that. Um, so I, I'm actually glad it's called Java Driver. Makes sense. Um, So seeing as we've got 10, 15 minutes here, Nate, until um, lunch, or a break at least, um, maybe you want to take the platform to just discuss more about Introvert and just uh, maybe drivers for you, you guys doing that, or, wow. you know what I mean? I can do that. We've got, we've got a bit of time here, so, um, you know. I actually had a presentation I did. I cribbed some stuff from it before, for, this was an internal AppG presentation I did a couple months ago. Um, yeah, let me do that real quick. All right. Um, so a tail two protocols, some of what we went over in a high level. The good of Thrift, useful transport options, flexible, extensible API definition, the bad. Generated code means ugly. Generated clients are basically by necessity, idiomatic clients. Um, these next couple of slides are opinion. And again, this was generated for an internal audience. So um, I do have some strong opinions there. So introvert, um, main features, easy to construct most common operations. Um, simple rest semantics, post, you know, my key space, my column family, key one, I send the username, get, get that username back. Pretty stupid, simple. Um, the, uh, the guys at Health Market Sciences actually have this functionality up on their website. I forget the name of the project, but it's, um, they have a REST endpoint for standard working already. We actually took some of the functionality for that for these simple operations. But the real fun stuff comes in the JSON payload, um, define slice operation. I want to make a slice, I want to start at nine, I want to end at five, and send size of, you know, four. Um, set operation, pretty straightforward. Really easy to use composites, you know, they're just JSON arrays. Um, one or more commands per payload. So here's what a payload looks like. Set key space, create key space, create column family, set auto timestamp, um, set, and then slice. So. You can really batch these things pretty well. Um, the batching's flexible. You can put both reads and writes together. You can do different key spaces in the same mutations. Um, you can change key spaces mid-op, and you can stream back over HTTP. Um, here's a neat idea. If, if you could you know, fire off some really big ops and stream results back over WebSocket, that'd be kind of silly. Um, Server-side filtering. Get me everybody where age is greater than 21. Um, this is cribbed right out of an internal test case. So it's going directly to the storage service layer. But you can see here that I'm uploading a Groovy, a Groovy script dynamically um, via payload to actually filter the results of uh, return age, everything where age is over 21. Um, Git ref, there's one or two people who do this already. It's like PLSQL for Cassandra. Um, a probably results of one operation is input from another. Um, I want to set row B to the results of getting the value of key five. Um, triggers. Perform complex multi-step server-side operations. Um, examine and change request objects. Interface directly with introvert. Um, interface directly with Cassandra. You know, good, bad, and ugly. But with this presentation is about 60 days old at this point. We put a lot of our stuff in there now. Um, 
there's also the ability to do uh, well one of the things that we've we sort of hit on is that with this type of fun of um, functionality uh, this is using invoke dynamic in JDK 7 so there's a lot of stuff you can do here this could be groovy this could be JavaScript this could be Python this could be whatever you wanted it to be but we have not only filters, but we also have the concept of coprocessors and processors like you have in HBase, um, as well as uh, you know, ability to do unions and you know, entire column family iteration and like spit out results as you go along. So you know, what if we took some of that stuff, um, put it together a certain way, used callback mechanisms built into Vertex like you know, WebSocket and push that stuff back over the wire with the ability to scatter it around via Vertex's event bus, which I highly encourage you to look at if you've not looked at yet. And um, all of a sudden, you can do things like MapReduce mediated from a client. And you know, change what you're doing on the fly via JavaScript from the client. And suddenly, there's some really sort of interesting use cases that open up there. Um, so again, we'll be talking a lot more about this towards the end of the month, but it's up there on GitHub already. Okay, so thank you. All right, Thanks, thanks. Nate.